Chapter 2, Fundamental Data Types, Part 6. So it's important to be able to solve a problem by hand because as we said previously, you can't write a computer program to uh, uh, solve a problem if you don't know first know how to solve the problem, if you don't have the algorithm to solve the problem. Um, so for example, let's, let's take a look at this particular uh, example. And we have a row of black and white tiles that needs to be placed along a wall. For aesthetic reasons, we want the first and the last tile to be black. So how are we going to do that? Our task is to compute the number of tiles needed and the gap at each end, given the space available and the width of each tile. So let's say we have a total width of 100 inches. Each tile is 5 inches wide. And um, so we can say that 100 inches divided by a 5 inches tile, that makes 20 tiles perfect, no gap. However, the architect says that the first and the last tiles shall be black. So if we start with one black tile and then um, no, then, then white-black pairs, so we start with black tile, then we have white-black, white-black, white-black. Um, in our example, a white-black pair is 10 inches wide. So given our length of our total length of 100 inches and we have a tile width of 5 inches, so if we calculate the width of all tiles, the first one black tile equals 5 inches, and we add that to 9 pairs of black white tiles, that equals 90 inches, for a total width of 95 inches. So our gap at each end, you can see 100 minus 95 is going to be a 5 inch gap, and then we're going to put distribute it evenly at each end, so it's divided by 2, it's 2 and a half inches at each end. So how are we going to do this in an algorithm? We've just kind of thrown that together by hand, but how do we do this so that we can translate it into some code and repeat this problem-solving process consistently? Um, we know that our parts must be a whole number because we're not going to have part of a tile. And so we're going to have our total width minus our tile width divided by 2 times our tile width uh, is going to be our, our integer part. We're not going to have a fraction there. So how many tiles do we need? We need one tile plus two times the number of pairs, the black-white pairs. And then we calculate our gap at each end by taking the total width, subtracting the number of tiles times the tile width, divided all that whole quantity divided by two. Let's talk about strings. A string type is what's known as a reference type in Java. It's built in. The nice folks at Sun Microsystems develop the string type, and we can just use it. We don't have to create it all ourselves. And so we use it like a regular data type, just like we would with one of the primitive types, the int, double, char, boolean that we've talked about before. The name of the data type is string with an uppercase s, indicating it's a reference type, followed by the name that we want to use for the string, followed by the equal sign, and double quotes around a... Um, a string literal. Notice in our example there that third bullet point string name equals Harry that should have a semicolon at the end to note to denote the end of the statement. So once you have a string variable you can use string methods. There are, we'll see in just a moment, some different string methods but the length method will return how many characters are in that string. So if name contains the string Harry, name.length is going to be 5 because there are 5 characters in Harry. And note that 5 is an integer, so we're going to store this result in the integer variable n. The, string, the string's length is the number of characters it contains. An empty string has a length of 0 and is just shown as two quotes right next to each other. Um, the maximum length of the string is, is an integer, so 2.1 billion or something like that. Um, it's very, very large. I doubt that you would ever have a string that large. You can put two strings together. It's known as concatenation. That's a nice vocab word that just means put two strings together. If we want to put Harry and Morgan together, we store Harry in, in the string variable F name, Morgan in the string variable L name, and then string name equals F name plus L name. That just puts the two strings together, as in Harry Morgan, with no space between them. Oh, gosh. Notice, I'm sorry, found another typo. String F name equals Harry should have a semicolon at the end. String L name equals Morgan should have a semicolon at the end. Um, uh, the plus sign in this case concatenates two strings together. If we want to put a space between them, we have to concatenate a space in between them. And notice we just put two double quotes around a space, and that 
denotes a string literal, which is just a space. Um, we can also concatenate numbers with strings. What happens is Java will automatically convert that number to a string and then concatenate the two together. So as in agent 7, it um, will convert the integer n to a string and then concatenate the two. Um, we can also do that inside a printlin statement, as in system.println, the total is plus total. So that takes the integer 7, uh, excuse me, the integer contained in the variable total and then concatenates that to the string constant or string literal the total is. We can also get string input. We saw previously the three steps that we need to get console input from the user. That's import the um, uh, the scanner class, import the scanner library, create the scanner object, and then uh, implement one of the scanner methods. So if we're assuming that we've done that already, uh, it created, imported, and then created the object, we can say string name equals in dot next. Next is the method that reads one word at a time. It looks for white space. That means a space bar, an enter key, um, a tab key. That white space is a delimiter. That means it separates one word from another. You can write an entire line, you can read an entire line of console input by saying in dot next line that will get all the characters up to the enter key. Um, we can also convert a string variable to a number. So if we say uh, input a string input equals in dot next line, and then we need to use that as an, a number, we can say int age equals integer dot parse int input. Notice we're taking the string variable input. We're sending that to a method. The method is called parse int, and it belongs to the integer class. So to convert that string to an integer, we say integer with an uppercase i dot parse int. Strings also can contain escape sequences. Escape sequences allow us to format our output or to uh, provide some special instructions with respect to strings. So if we wanted to put a, uh, a double quote inside our output, as in he said, quote, hello, close quote. If we put just a quote by itself, that would denote the end of the string. So we have to do something special to say, hey, no, really, I want you to print the quote mark. And we do that with the backslash key. Notice the backslash key is on your keyboard, probably above the return key or the enter key. So why don't you look for it now? It's on the right-hand side uh, near the top, near the delete or backspace key. Um, so we use that backslash key followed by some special character, in this case a double quote. So he said backslash double quote, hello, backslash double quote, double quote. That will print he said quote, hello, quote. So how do we print the backslash? We preface it with another backslash. So if we wanted to print c colon backslash temp backslash secret dot txt, we would need to say backslash backslash. That would enable us to print that backslash key. We can also use it to uh, uh, input a new line. So that's essentially the same as pressing the return key. So system dot dot print asterisk backslash n asterisk asterisk backslash n asterisk 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 backslash n will cause the return key to be pressed three times essentially in this output. So backslash n says press the enter key or the return key. And notice the, uh, the triangle of asterisks that are shown there. So strings are sequences of characters, and they are Unicode characters. And um, I can show you in class, at, oh, excuse me, look at Appendix B in your book, and you'll see a table of the Unicode characters. Um, it says here, see the ASCII code chart, A-S-C-I-I -I is how it said ASCII code chart in Appendix B. ASCII was uh, an earlier version of this code. They realized that they needed to include more characters than just a standard character set that you see on an English keyboard. So the Unicode characters allow us to extend that character set to have uh, many more characters. However, all of the characters in the English alphabet, both upper and lower case, are part of the ASCII subset of Unicode. So I ask you to memorize two things, aren't on this slide, but I ask you to memorize two things about the ASCII table. Number one, uppercase A has the numerical value of 65. The reason I ask you that is so that you have a frame of reference. It shows us here that H has a value of 72. Well, if we remember that uppercase A has a value of 65, we can calculate that H. 
We could calculate M, we could calculate P, we could calculate all of them. The other thing I ask you to remember is that uppercase comes before lowercase. So if you're comparing numbers, excuse me, if you're comparing letters, um, all of the uppercase letters have a value that's less than all of the lowercase letters. Also, note, so there's two things. Number one, uppercase A has a value of 65. Number two, all uppercase comes before lowercase. So character values have a single quote around them, as in single quote B, single quote, and strings have double quotes around them. That indicates whether it's a character or whether it's a string.